So let's go. I'm going to read you a lot of Bible today. I hope it's okay. I hope you have your Bible close by. We will have the verses for you most on the screen as always. But I want to encourage you, bring your Bible to church. When the preacher opens his mouth, you open the Word of God. Open your Bible, take notes as best you can, make notation, go back and watch the service later on, begin to glean off the message, learn your spiritual formation that way. Luke chapter 4, here we go. I love this. This is Jesus' mission-esque statement. He has lots of mission, but this is the time where he says this to the temple people, and and they get a little bit salty with him. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim the freedom of the prisoners and recovery of the sight for the blind and to set the oppressed free and to proclaim the year of the Lord's what? Favor. One more shot. The year of the Lord's favor. There you go. Hit that. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened upon him. He began by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. What a statement Jesus makes. Jesus has come on the scene, and he's come to help give good news to the poor, to set the captive free, to give sight to the blind, and bring prisoners back to a place of full freedom in their life. And then he says, and to proclaim and declare the year or the season of the Lord's favor. Through the person of Jesus Christ, he ushered into us as he did then. Today we still have this opportunity. The acceptable year or the year of God's favor. The time of God's grace, the time of God's redemption, the time of God's deliverance is now at hand. Through Jesus Christ. We have grace. Let me thank God for grace. We have redemption. Let me thank God for redemption. We have deliverance all because of Jesus Christ. We see this unfold right here in the temple. Now, all this happens for a reason, and it brings us into a new season in which through Jesus Christ, we have the power to repent of our sinful ways and move into the wholeness and the fulfillment of eternal life, the free gift from Jesus to us by his work upon the cross Why? Because God loves us so much, he wants to bring us to a season of favor in our life. Now, favor in present day for many people, they love the word favor because it's almost like that that whole Christian lottery conversation. And prosperity people will will, will try to uh, teach favor from the angle of, you know, if you'll do this, God will do that by Tuesday. And be very careful about that because sometimes God's plans aren't your plans. And you can be faithful for a season and not see much, then it all can come together at one time. But God keeps his word. God does not lie. God keeps his word to us. And so you can always be rest assured that whatever God's promised, he will do. Favor is not the spiritual lottery. I had a buddy of mine, he's always in this favor conversation. He would get a good parking spot. Good parking spot. He'd go, favor ain't fair. Light goes from red to green. Favor ain't fair. No, it's a red light. It, It turns red to green on a cycle. It happens every so many minutes, and it's not about favor or unfavor because the, the, the guy who's not in God's favor, he got the front parking spot too. So be careful about this because when we say God's favor, it's easy to cling on to that as if it's some kind of monopoly conversation where if I get favor from God, blessing from God, I'm going to have all this stuff come to me. In fact, people even go around saying, favor come to me. Favor is upon all of us who proclaim Jesus as our Savior. All of us have access to God's favor. Can I get an amen today? All of us have access to God's favor. Now, that does not mean there are different elements of which God can bless. That part is certainly true. But we don't want to be, uh, let's see, manipulative about the word favor in both our practices or professions. Psalm chapter 5, I love this text. This is lengthy, but you've got to hear this. Verse 1 through 12, he says, listen to my words. Consider my lament, Lord. Hear my cry for help, my King and my God. For to you I pray in the morning, Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning I lay my request before you and wait expectantly. For you are not a God who is pleased with what? Wickedness. Notice these words here. Wickedness with you, evil people are not welcome. Strong language right there. The arrogant 
cannot stand in your presence. That's an important line for us. You hate all who do wrong. You destroy those who tell lies. The bloodthirsty and the deceitful, Lord, you detest them. But I, by your great love, can come into your house and reverence. I bow down toward your holy temple. Lead me, Lord. Lead me in righteousness because of my enemies. Make me walk the way that's straight before me. Not a word from my mouth can be trusted that their heart is filled with malice. Their throat is an open grave. Their tongue tells deceitful lies. Declare them guilty, O Lord, he's crying out. Let their intrigues be their downfall. Banish them from their many sins, for they rebelled against you. But let all who take refuge in you be glad. All who take what refuge in you be glad, he says. Let them ever sing for joy. Spread the protection over them that those who love your name may rejoice in it. Watch verse 12 close. Surely, everybody say surely. Surely, Lord, you bless the who? Righteous. You surround them with your favor as a what? Shield. Who would like to have the shield of God's favor upon your life every day? It goes before you, it protects you, it keeps you, and you find refuge in God. Notice the words at the end of this psalm. After all this stuff he, he explained about, Lord, you don't like this, you won't handle that. They're not welcome here. Talk about wickedness and evil. Then he says, Lord, protect the rest, protect me, protect those who are righteous. And then he says, because upon these people, these kind of people, your favor shall come. There must be a way that we can step into the favor of God and a real connection between sovereignty and our responsibility. God's a sovereign God. God will do what he wills to do. I cannot predict God. I cannot guarantee what God will do. What I can tell you is this. He keeps his word. He's a, lie. He's a God who does not lie. But he also works on a different space and time than you and I do. That's reality. And, and honestly, that is probably very difficult to process because I am very much into who likes quick results? Who likes quick results? You guys are lying right now through your... No, Marty, we're very patient people. We're not patient at all. We I mean, we have to have popcorn now in two and a half minutes. I, I grew up and popcorn took days to make downstairs on the, on the, hot, on the hot stove in the basement. I, I mean, so we are, we are quick result-minded thinkers. Now watch this, though. In God's favor, there's unlimited things God can do. Here's the challenge of quick results. If we start pinning God's results into expediency, we will miss what he's really able to do through our life. Because we have a God who's able to do exceedingly and above all more than we could ask or even think. Do you see that? And so when we tend to get quick result oriented, God do this by Tuesday. God do this by next year. God, I want this. God, one of my favorite things is, God, I, I became a tither. I'm going to go to the mailbox tomorrow. Expect a blessing. You should go to the mailbox but if you get there and there's not a check for a million bucks, don't fail to honor God's word. Because God's timeline is not the same as my timeline or your timeline. So we understand from Scripture that there is a place in which we can step into God's favor. God's favor means to be blessed by God. It's a, it's a place of empowerment to prosper in your life. And again, this is not a prosperity message per se, but I do believe that he wants his people to prosper. God is not against your being blessed, your being favored, but listen, don't deceive yourself into some kind of spiritual Christian lottery. Hey, if we do this, we're going to get that tomorrow. I don't want you to have that mindset, but I would encourage you, still do that, but leave the results to a sovereign God who is a good God, a loving God, and a faithful God, and trust God at his word in every area of your life. That part do absolutely yes. So let's unpack this a bit. First of all, Jesus was favored. Look at this real quick in Luke chapter 2. This is a lengthy text. I won't read the whole thing for time's sake. But this is the text where Jesus gets left at the temple. His parents left him. They're headed back home. And they realize Jesus is missing. He's gone. 
So they hurry back to Jerusalem. Now, for context, this was not like the days and times of today. You didn't load your kids in the SUV, take them to the temple, and bring them home. You were in a herd of people caravaning together across the desert plain. So literally, families would just kind of interact together. And somehow or, or, not, or another, before home alone, there was Jesus alone at the temple. And they leave him. And they turn around, they go back, and they're a little bit frustrated. And mom and dad is in typical mom and dad form. are like, what are you doing? I mean, I can only get my mind around this. I know today's context, if my kid was gone like that, I mean, if, if your kid's gone missing like that, I mean, you're thinking, what's wrong? What, what did you disconnect from? I told you, stay with us the whole time. You're going to give the kid the lecture, right? You're going to go down the list of things to never do again. You made me so nervous. You scared me to death. What's going on around here? And Jesus goes, hey, don't you guys know? That I'm here about my father's business? And then in verse 51, 52, the Bible says that he submitted or was subject to his mom and dad, Mary and Joseph. And then the Bible says in 252, it says, And Jesus grew in stature and in favor with both God and man. So through the person of Christ, we understand that he is our model for favor. And then because he had favor, we can have favor too. But again, don't think about favor like a spiritual checklist of, hey, if I do this, this, and this, this will have an outcome. I know that by nature, we like things quickly. We're not really given to delays. We, we want it all now. We have to have our coffee in a matter of seconds. We have to have this in a matter of hours or this in a matter of days. And if it's not there, then we want no part of it because it's not on our time. Hear, hear me today. God's timeline is not the same as my timeline or your timeline. So don't confuse a delay with lacking God's favor. And don't confuse expediency with having an extra amount of favor. Oh, I get from God what I ask of him. Doesn't work that way. And if today you begin to practice the things of God in a righteous heart way and a humble heart way and God doesn't come through by noon tomorrow, it doesn't make him any less God. And today if you get to the grocery store or the restaurant and you got a good parking spot or you got a bad parking spot, don't think it's the favor or the disfavor. It's just a parking spot. And today if you get to the grocery store and you get a special sale, don't think it's the favor. Just think it's a sale. I'm saying all this to set you free from this idea that I can predict what God will do in my life. But what I can do is I can meet the intersection of God's sovereignty with my responsibility, and I can watch God work on my behalf to take me place I can never go myself. That's the kind of God we serve today. He is indeed a very good and a favorable God who loves us dearly today. So let's unpack the favor environment. What would it look like to have an environment in your house in which God's favor can come in any time in your marriage, in your parenting, in your health, in your finance, that God could come in and say, I'm gonna put some favor in this person's life today. Here's the first thing. Favor begins with a submissive heart. Jesus, the Bible says, was obedient or submitted to his parents. Before favor came in, he was acting in a place of submission. Now watch this. It's important because by nature, we do not have submitted hearts by nature. We have arrogant hearts. We have prideful hearts. The book of James says to us, it says that God resists the proud, but he gives favor to the who? The humble. If you go on and read that text, it says, Submit yourself to God, resist the devil, he will flee, come near to God, he'll come near to you, wash your hands, you sinners, purify your hearts, you double minded, grieve, mourn, wail, change your laughter to mourning, your joy to gloom, humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. Watch what happens to us. When we go down, God elevates us up. When we resist the devil, God comes into our life. Favor is a gift to us from a God who loves us. Don't think you can control God's favor, but understand the intercept between sovereignty and responsibility. 
responsibility and watch God favor and bless your life. You go humble, let God exalt you. Culture says you go big, you go proud, make people notice you. I say go humble and let God elevate you. Let God do a work in your life. Let God exalt you among everybody else. Let God be the source of what happens. So a submissive heart is important. Here's why James 4 tells us God resists the proud. Pride and favor do not go together. So if you have God's favor, it's not for the purpose of making you more proud. It's for the purpose of making you more humble. Now, in culture today, humility is not a trait that's desired by many or really any. In fact, culture pushes you the opposite way. Culture pushes you toward the idea of making sure people know who you are, make sure you declare your goodness, and make sure you talk about yourself on a regular basis. Yet, scripturally speaking, we understand that humility and favor go together, whereas God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. James chapter 4. When you look at this and unpack this, it then says to submit yourself then to God. Resist the devil, he will flee from you. Verse 7. Now watch this. At verse 8 says, come near to God, he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning, your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of God, and he will what? He will lift you up. Watch this. In the Christian faith, in humility, and in favor conversations, we go low for God to raise us up high. We resist the devil and we draw close to God. It's a push and it's a pull. It's a go low and God brings you high. Let him elevate you, not yourself or somebody else. Listen, everybody here today, anything in our life we have, any quality, any gift, any goodness, anything at all, any resource, any talent is a gift to you from God. It's all his. We go low, he brings you high. We push the devil away, we draw God in. This is how you walk in God's favor and that's a submitted heart. Listen, our hearts every day need to be washed by the the power of the Holy Spirit. Your heart, my heart, my heart, listen, I'll talk about me for a second. My heart cannot miss a daily shower by the Holy Spirit. Because the world around you, the things we encounter and we interface with, creates a hardened heart, creates a difficult heart, brokenness, sin. Uh, deception, lies, lust, all this stuff is out there all the time. And if we don't let our heart be washed by the cleansing of the Spirit of God, we can develop a hardened heart really fast at somebody else, at the church, at God, at the Word of God, at a neighbor, at a spouse. And once you get a hardened heart, you can't get to see the Word of God in that heart. Who wants God's Word to go in deep in your life? Keep a submitted heart. So favor connects with a submitted heart. Second thought real fast, if you're taking notes, write this down. Favor, listen close, is both vertical and horizontal. Favor is not just to make you and God have your own thing going. Favor is not just to make you ultra spiritual and then your neighbors can't even talk to you. Favor is a vertical, everybody say vertical, and favor is horizontal. Everybody say horizontal. So it's you and God, and it's you and your fellow man. Favor manifests in earthly relationships. God's favor, watch this, is an attraction for other unbelievers to come and find out what is unique about you. What is different about you? Uh, I, I just notice when I'm with you, you're always more optimistic. You're always more excited. You're always more ethical. You're always more faithful. You're always more generous. You're always more gracious. You're always this. You're always this. You're always this. What is different about you? What's the favor of God? It's something he brings into your life, and now your fellow man is not pushed away. They're drawn in. Why is that important? Because when they draw close to you, they can see God through you. And now you have pivoted to becoming a place in which God's favor that rests upon you now impacts those who are unbelievers, and now they want to come to find out about this man named Jesus and what he's done for you. You've all of a sudden become a living testimony of God's favor. Who would like favor upon your life today? Are you prepared 
to let that favor not just go this way, but go this way. For some of you, favors start at the restaurant today, being nice to your waitress or waiter. For some of you, favors starts getting out of the parking lot at Calvary. Shaking my head. Favor starts not just here, but it's also here. Jesus grew in stature and favor with God. Everybody say God. And everybody say man. It's not just about me and God. It's always about me and God and me and my spouse, me and my sons, me and my coworkers, me and my neighbors. Me and those that don't like me, me and those that I may not like myself, me and those that God's trying to work something out in me because of them and through them. God's making me better because of somebody else. Anybody got friends like that? God makes you better because of them in the house? Yeah. God's working on your patience. God's working on your long suffering with somebody else. All of us have people like that in our life. That's how God works on you. And I don't know about you, but I need God to always be working on me because I am a work in progress every day of my life. I know you guys are perfect, but I am not, so give me lots of grace, okay? I promise you I need it today. Favor is both vertical and horizontal, every area of our life. Ephesians says this. Ephesians tells us this picture. That God gives you the, the prophetic ministry, the pastoral ministry, the teaching ministry, the evangelist, the pastor, because he wants to shape you into the image of Christ, into the body of Christ. That's the favor, both vertical and horizontal, right there. It'll bring you into place of growing in God's grace every day. Here's the next thought for you. Favor is moving, not stagnant. Stagnation is not part of the Christian life. Stagnant things. Anybody by chance ever, ever, ever been to Israel? Israel? Israel, by chance? Been to the Dead Sea? Everything flows in, nothing comes out. No life. It's a weird water. It's silky. It's kind of strange. Don't drink it. It's nasty. Everything goes in, nothing flows out. If you look at Deuteronomy chapter 28, there's an awesome texture for the Israelites. God's saying this through, through uh, Moses to us. It says, if you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully follow his commands I give to you today, the Lord your God will set you high above the nations on the earth, he says. All these blessings will come on your, you and your company. Watch this. If you obey the Lord your God. You'll be blessed in the city. You'll be blessed in the country or Anybody in the house, Fred Hammond, by the way? Anybody else in the house? Fred Hammond, by the way, you know, blessed in the city, blessed in the field, blessed when you come, blessed when you go. It's right here in the text. You'll be blessed in the fruit of your womb. Be blessed in the crops of your land. Your livestock will be young. The calves of your herds, the lambs of your flocks, your basket and your kneading through them will be blessed. You will be blessed when you come in and blessed when you go out. Or favor when you come in and favor when you go out. When you see the phrase in the Bible, in and out, everybody say in and out. That's not the burger place, by the way. Before that burger place, this was actually a term in the Old Testament to identify coming into the house to worship and going out to battle. Out to battle and into worship. In and out. Come into worship, go out to battle. Now watch this. Favor is not stagnant. Favor is moving. Hear me, Christians. Hear me, believers. Hear me, disciples. Get moving. Move. Come on, say move. move. Way too many believers want to get to the hammock spirituality. We want to get to the sit and watch spirituality. Listen, this is a place of movement. The Holy Spirit is moving. God is moving. His favor is moving. We should be moving too. Get yourself on the move when you go to the house of God. We should be a church that's always going and doing and blessing and increasing. One of my favorite stories in the Bible, watch this, is the Old Testament, or the New Testament, New Testament story. Jesus tells this. This is a guy that had the big crop, so he thought, I'm going to build bigger barns. I got all this stuff for me. And he says, I'm going to say to myself, self, you've done a great job. Just sit back and relax. He had no idea that the favor wasn't to relax. It was to sow more seed and to bless more people. It was to go beyond himself. Favor isn't stagnant. Favor is, come on, say moving. Favor's moving somewhere. Get on the move if you want God's favor. Don't just hoard it in, push it out. Last thought, favor is found 
in the image of Jesus Christ. If he had favor, if we conform to his image and likes, we'll have God's favor upon our life every day. Watch this. God's favor is among us. It's the season of God's favor through Jesus Christ. Favor is not a lottery conversation. Favor is a gift to you from a Father in heaven that loves you dearly and has a plan for your life, but you've got to get in the zone of God's favor. You want favor? Get in. In the favor zone. Walk in the favor pathway. Walk like Jesus walked. Live like he lived. Do what he did. Submit your heart. Cleanse your heart. Obey God's plan for your life and watch God's favor hit you every day. It's here. It's here. It's here. It's here. It's yours. It's mine. We can all have it today. And it's not a parking spot. It's not a financial gift. It's every area of your life. God's favor is here for you today. If you choose to receive it, it's a free gift to you and to me. We thank God for God's favor today across this house.